Has your family pet gone missing? This woman and her team of specialists are hot on the trail. She's hot. Explore the mysterious legends of the sacred cat of Burma. And a shelter dog with aggression problems finds a new loving home thanks to our pet trainer 911. Plus, tips on keeping your kitty safe. All this and more up next on Animal Attractions TV. When a loved one is missing, there are specially trained investigators who lead the charge to bring them home. Backed by years of training, experience, and a dedicated team of experts. But what about missing pets? Are there really pet detectives who are ready to answer the call? We're here to tell you yes. Gentlemen, our case today is Veronica, a six and a half year old female cat that went out for her walk and didn't return. Kate, you've got lead on this. Dodge, you're coming in as a specialist. Houston, you've got backup. Gentlemen, we have only eight hours of daylight left. Let's go. The um, uh, common phrase made popular by Jim Carrey is pet detective. I would say professionally there's less than a handful of people in the country that actually do this. I've been a private investigator since 1996. And in 2005 I went from looking for missing people to missing dogs and cats. The dogs obviously are a huge part of the team. As, as we say in the industry, I actually run on the dumb end of the leash, Cade. I have a saying that when I grow up, I want to be like Cade. <laughs> Cade actually helped start my business. His specialty is actually long distance. He can run descent from a great distance. He can also detect scent over a tremendous amount of time. We have confirmed scent with Cade at five and a half months. We've actually tested Cade hiding an animal a quarter mile away without a track in a car with a window rolled slightly down. And he found that pet within three minutes. Houston's one of the newest members. He's our rookie. Houston's a great fit for us because he's very high energy. He appears to lack focus, but actually that hard-headedness where he keeps driving and keeps driving works for us. When, when you're out after a missing cat, cats don't hide in neighborhoods. They hide out in the woods. They hide in briar patches. And these dogs have to go wherever the kitty went. So he's a tough dog. And, and his lack of focus and that, that drive or that hard-headedness is what makes him really a value to us. Dodger really showed us that he wanted to do this work. He is a thinker. Uh, he's a decision maker. When, when I have something where I need a decision to be made, it's usually Dodger that I'm going to bring out. If I need something intricate or fine line, for instance, if we have a situation where we fear that the pet may be deceased, we've come in, we've tracked a long way, and Cade and Houston are saying to me, hey, there's no scent here, we'll bring Dodger in and we'll give Dodger a command. Um, we'll tell him find bones, that's his, his little command. And he'll go off leash and he'll actually go out and he'll find us any decomposing scent. That can be blood, it can be hair, it can be bone, but he'll find us everything in the area. And um, that helps pet owners with closure. You know, I can't really say that they actually work for me. They, they do, they do this for me. But they do this for me because we, ha we have a bond and they are my partners in the truest sense. And every morning, no matter how many times they've gone out, they get up and they run for that van getting ready for the next case. Typically, the call comes in and we have a pet owner on the other end who's distraught. Um, they don't know what to do. They're in a state of panic because their family member is missing. So we make arrangements. During the week, we'll probably work anywhere between two and four cases a week, depending on where in the United States the case is. We travel all over the country, from California to New York, and from Florida to Michigan. So when she went missing that day, what were some of the things that you guys did right away? Because that helps us in profiling. So that, that first day, what did you do? 
Well, we looked in the backyard to see if she was climbing a tree or just playing outside. Once we arrive and, and we meet with the pet owners, we'll do a small consultation, but pretty much we already have a relationship. We already know what's what's happening. We called the neighbors and seeing if they could help, and we didn't. They didn't have any information. They'll show me a little bit about their house, um, where the pet was last seen, what we call the point last seen. There's a lot to it. It's not just running behind dogs and, and uh, he went that away. It's much, much, much more intricate in terms of it's an investigation. We're going to need a scent article. Is there anything that has just Veronica scent on it? Now that can be a toy. That could be something that the pet has laid on. But the most important criteria is that it can't have the scent of any other animal. And then basically, it's out to the truck. We take the scent article and we're on the ground tracking. Find it, find it, go. We use three to four dogs on the team all the time. The dogs actually confirm each other because they all have the ability to track and trail, but they all actually have specialties. Kate is long distance. Dodger actually is more of a tracking dog. He also does uh, alerts in terms of what we call close finds. And yes, I run behind him. We'll switch dogs, but we never switch handlers. <laughs> Houston is a straight tracking dog. He has to be fairly close to the trail, and we would use Houston when we're getting in pretty close. Cade we probably wouldn't use as much. Once we know we're close in, we're gonna switch to one of the dogs that are closer to the trail, or which is a tracker. Come, come, quick, come, hurry. All right, that's the boy. Hey there, little girl. You got trapped. You got stuck in here. I know, kind of scary. Well, let's get you out of here. All right, Dodgy, you did a good job, Bubba. Let's go. Sadly, the need for our services are very great. I encourage everyone who has a four-pod family member to put a collar and a tag with a current phone number on your pet. Take a photo from the back, from the side, and from the front, followed by, very important, that you have a scent article of your pet. Rub your pet for 15 seconds with a very clean cloth, put it in a, in a baggie and save it. Because now you have what you know is a 100% scent article that if you ever had to have your pet be tracked, we have a scent article. Veronica! Good news, Yay! she's home! Oh, yeah. Should you need our services, no case is too tough, no trail too long. Give us a call. Casey and I enjoy walks and having fun in the fresh air. But just like biking or driving, there are some rules for the road and sidewalks. Number one, don't leave home without a collar and leash. There are leash laws nearly everywhere. Number two, no pun intended, Always be prepared to pick up after your pet. Not only to keep the area where you're walking pleasant and healthy, it can also save you money. Most cities have fines for not picking up after pets. In New York City, leaving one doggy pile will cost you 250 bucks. Number three, your pet should also be able to behave while on a walk. They need to be able to heal properly, stop, and sit. Not everyone loves to be next to pets. It is important to have control over your pet so they do not interact with Leave people it. that do not Leave want it. their attention. While on a walk, you might come in contact with other owners and their dogs. Always remember you can only control your pet and to enter each situation with caution. It is perfectly all right to keep on walking by another dog without any interaction. If you feel like interacting with other owners and pets, always ask. Mind if she says hi? No, absolutely. You can ask something like, May I meet your dog? Or would you like to meet my dog? And remember, a no is a perfectly fine response. Sometimes you don't have time for a visit, and sometimes you just want to enjoy some quality time on your own. Isn't that right, Casey? Who knows more about why cats behave in their mysterious ways than Roger Tabor? We say no one. He has devoted more than 30 years pioneering studies and observing cats in over 25 countries. He's here to share his knowledge and experience so you can enjoy the benefits that come with a better understanding of this wonderful creatures that we all call cats. When kittens are this small and this cute, it's very hard to think of them as hunters, but hunters they are. And the great thing about the cat family is that it really doesn't matter whether you're thinking of 
great big tigers from Siberia, or the slightly smaller tigers from India, or the very small little house cat. They all have within them the need to hunt. They are carnivores. They are the supreme mammalian carnivore. And as such, even as you see this one learning to play with the little ball here and getting his eye in, it's all building up towards the time of adulthood when he needs to be a hunter. Carnivores are clever. It's what attracts us to them. After all, we could live with gerbils or rabbits, but we choose to live with carnivores. And hunting is what the animal is entirely about in its evolutionary background. And yet, it's not just there with a pattern. They really do have to learn how to do it. They've got the claws, they've got the teeth, they've got the eyes, but mum has to train them with the how. And by playing with them and teasing them, they gradually improve their skills. So by understanding how they develop these skills and their relationship as they develop, we can get a better relationship ourselves with our cats. I'm doing such an important job here. It may not look like it, but playing with kittens is just about the most important thing you can do in a cat's life. Because what I'm doing at the moment is socializing this kitten. It may just look like play. Well, it is play and it's fun. But there's a profound change that's happening to this kitten because of that. For the rest of its life, it won't be as wary of people. It won't get that adrenaline surge and all the anxiety that goes with it. Because after all, kittens, back through evolutionary time, just grow up into being wild cats. But living with us, we don't want cats to be fearful. We want them to be relaxed. So there's a trick, and it's a very profound trick. We pretend we're litter mates. Now, how do we do that? Well, when this little one's eyes opened at the ages of 10 days or thereabouts, up till then, it had just been mum's teat and warmth, and suddenly, there are all these litter mates around. And that's really the trick we're doing. We're suddenly putting ourselves in and playing with the kittens from that age onwards. And then they learn about us as litter mates. Then for the rest of its life, it will think of us as sort of cats and will be less fearful. And there does come a point, and it's round about 12 weeks, beyond which you're not really going to be able to socialize a cat properly. And frankly, from eight weeks on, it's a hard task if the kitten hasn't been socialized before. And that's quite an important thing I'm saying because it's really saying that you really do need to check out when you pick up your kitten that somebody has done this very simple task of playing with a kitten every day, just for a little bit of time. If they haven't been socialized, you can't really change them that much. You can sort of tame them like you tame a tiger. But realistically, to socialize them, you need to make sure somebody has been in there on a daily basis just playing with a kitten. It's not a hard job. All across America, there are millions of lost, abandoned, and mistreated animals being held in local shelters. Many of them could find loving and caring homes, but because of the limited space and the overwhelming numbers of animals taken in, there's not much time left for them. Coach Ronald White believes that professional training can help make some of these dogs more adoptable. And he wants to make sure there's a happy ending to these shelter stories. Here at Animal Care and Control, we are a city shelter and we are required to take in anything that comes to us. Even though we're not a no-kill shelter, we do try to place as many animals as we can but maybe 30 a week actually go out in adoptions versus, you know, 100 a day coming in through the doors. The conditions are good for the animals. They're fed and they're clean, but it's, it's not like being in a home. And the longer they're in the kennel, they can become just aggressive and territorial to their cage here which hurts their chances of people looking for adoptions because they may seem aggressive when they're really not. Amy has picked out a troubled dog for Coach Ronald White to train in order to increase his chances of adoption. So what kind of dog is he? Coach White Brownie is a three-year-old male Cocker Spaniel. 
He uh, got adopted, went home, was showing some territorial issues. They didn't know how to handle it, so they returned him. They were scared of biting and stuff like that. Oh, okay, so other than the food, uh, you can pet and love on him. Yes. But well, when there's food around, he protects yes. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can do something with her. Okay. Find her a good home. Would you like to see? Yes, I would okay. like to Okay. Even though Brownie is a high-risk dog, with the help of Coach White and the right training in the right home, he could be a wonderful companion for someone. We'll give him a chance of life with a family. Coach White takes the dog from the shelter to his house for training. He calls this boot camp. Well, we call it boot camp where the dog can come there and get love and structure. All love and no structure makes a bad dog. But if you give a dog love and structure, you get a well-trained dog. Come on, buddy. Welcome home, buddy. Welcome home. I was very anxious to work with this dog because I knew what this dog's problem was. And he was food aggression. If there wasn't no food down, he was just as friendly. But when you put some food down, he thought he had to protect it. And they can't adopt out biters. And uh, I'm afraid if he don't get trained, they'll do something with him. First, the dog needs to learn some basic commands and understand that Coach is the boss. So what we do, we train him his basic obedience. Place. We train him to Place. sit, down, stay, Place. to come when called and to Don't walk sit. on the side of you when he's on the leash. Once Brownie has the basics, Coach can train him not to be aggressive with food. Leave it. Leave it. That's a good dog. And for the final test, Coach brings in another dog to train with Brownie. So when the little puppy came up to him and got in his food, I told the dog Bad that was dog. being aggressive to leave it. For he had get that command and I pulled the lead and I said, leave it. And he stopped growling at the other dog. I knew the dog when he was no longer aggressive with me or other dogs, I knew it was trying to find the owner. Well, I picked a lady, her name was Peggy and she was a part-time student. And I knew that this dog would be a perfect match with her. Peggy, you have a beautiful home. Well, thank you. This dog's gonna have it made here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. Of all the people that we had to choose for this dog, I chose you. Oh, well, I'm so excited. Thank you for calling me. So when we got the dog, he had an aggression problem with food and with toys, but we took that all away from him. Oh, wow. And we're gonna train you how to keep the dog trained. Oh, good. Well, I'm ready. Thank you so much for bringing him over. So are you ready to be trained? I am. Sign me up. I'm ready. Oh, thank you. Over there. He walks on. on your left. So I was okay, I going to train Peggy, and right she had a problem with how to hold the leash and how to hold her hands with it. So I showed her how to do it for the dog to know that she, she can handle it. Now hands down to your side. Okay. And you would tell him to heal. Okay. Heal. Well, once I got her to hold the leash in the right way, it didn't take long for Peggy to catch on. She caught right on, and then the dog started listening to her. There you go, you're doing great. Place. Now turn back towards me, tell him place. Place. You keep walking, I'll say stop. Stop. And tell him sit. Sit. There you go, you're doing great. That dog needed a dominant person over that dog because he had a, had an aggressive problem. Tell him, go home. Go home. Once I know Peggy understands the commands and the Stay. dog is listening to her, the dog was all hers. I thought those two would be a perfect couple. And uh, she adored that dog. And that dog will be there forever. No more shelter. Good boy. Good dog. There may be a perfect animal companion waiting for you right now. Visit your local shelter or humane society. You could be the author of the next chapter of their shelter stories. Good girl. Good girl, Casey. Casey is a nice, healthy dog that loves to play and stay active. But would you believe that there's a one in five chance that she's developing osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is a painful disease and the most common joint disorder in our pets. You may think of it as an old pet's disease, but actually pets may begin developing the disease much earlier than you think, as early as five to seven years. Large and giant breed puppies grow so rapidly that they need a specially formulated diet to carefully control bone growth. 
The signs can be very subtle at first. Your dog seems to take a little longer getting up in the morning. Then as time goes by, you may notice that she appears to be in pain as she walks, climbs the stairs a little slower, or is simply less playful. It's time to see your veterinarian. Treatment may be comprehensive to address what is happening now and to improve your pet's future. It includes therapeutic nutrition, medication, exercise, and rehabilitation. These are all key to reducing pain and improving your pet's quality of life. Your veterinarian may recommend a therapeutic food that is enriched with nutrients you've heard about for use in people, like omega-3 fatty acids, glucosamine, and chondroitin sulfate. Remember, as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So feed your pet a premium pet food enriched with fatty acids to ensure healthy joint development and enhanced mobility for a long, healthy, and active life. And that's working for you, Casey, isn't it, girl? Good girl. Said to be the guardians of the soul and devoted companions to priests, the origins of these cats are shrouded in mystery. What is this beautiful cat? The Burman, the sacred cats of Burma. There's a lot of, lot of legends about the cat. Uh, some people think that they really did come from Burma. And they were the sacred cat in the temples and the priests worshiped them. Uh, the story goes on that during those times, the cats were all white. And as the chief priest lie dying after being mugged in the street, the head cat jumped upon his chest. Everywhere that the cat touched the priest as the spirit moved into the cat remained white. And the golden glow and the other shading within the cat appeared as the spirit came into the cat. All cat fanciers don't believe this story, but it's fun to tell. And when you look into their soulful eyes, it does make you wonder. On the other hand, experts say the Burman is a French designer cat with Persian, Angora, and Siamese ancestors. I believe they started in France with a breeding pair that was sent there in the early 1900s. But during World War II, the breed became extinct again, and there were only two whole Burmans left after World War II. The French people started again outcrossing, um, inbreeding, to produce what we now call the Burman today. There are 20 different colors that these cats come in, counting colors and or patterns. When all Burmans are born, they're white, just as white as snow. And the very first thing you see is a little bit of color in the nose leather. And that nose color just kind of creeps up their nose. And pretty soon you start seeing a little bit of shading onto their paws and you start seeing the gloves. We also have what's called a lace, and that's a white mark on the back of the back leg. A cat must have all of these white marks in exactly the same place in order to show in championship. It's a lot of fun having a Burman. Um, they're very, very friendly. Um, he always wants to be um, involved with whatever you're doing in the house. He wants to come and join in. He loves people. He absolutely adores people. Um, anyone that will make a fuss of him, he's just, he'll turn on the purr and he'll be really happy. Have you ever heard the phrase, getting in a huff? Well, the Burman is known for its huff. Burmans huff regularly, and it sounds just as if they're, they're making a, a, a great puff of air that comes from within their chest. And it, it equates itself to a frown. The Burman will huff, and then it'll start hissing and or growling. But the huff kind of warns off uh, people around it that it's not very happy, that I'm, I am frowning. I'm not a very happy kitty. Burmans enjoy being lap cats, but they're not as laid back as some long-haired breeds. They love to play, and not just as kittens. They like to play through their entire lives. It's a kitty with a what we call a long, stocky body. When you pick up a Burman, you're holding on to something. There's nothing frail about this kitty. They're a well-boned cat, a balanced cat. The top line of a Burman is, is straight. When, he, when this Burman walks, this line is level. This cat, because he's level, the legs are, are basically the same length. That's, that what, that's what gives him the walk like a tiger gait. Burmans come in two kinds of coats. There's a shorter plusher coat, and some have a long silky coat. 
Neither type mats, but they will shed, so they're fairly easy to maintain. They all have blue eyes. It's the only eye color acceptable in our breed. The bluer, the better. I like to breed for the deeper and deeper and deeper eye color. I like the eye color that hinges almost on purple. When I saw one, I knew that I really wanted one. They were just so friendly. The Burman cat is described as polite, affectionate, intelligent, and devoted. And the sacred cat of Burma will worship the ground you walk on. A good relationship with your veterinarian is only half the battle in raising a healthy kitty, especially the curious kind like Bella who loves to hide and may not always know when she's in danger. You may want to try out these tips on keeping your kitty safe. Keep doors to appliances closed. A warm dryer is very tempting to a kitty who loves to hide, but if not seen in time, a few tumbles could break her neck. An open dishwasher is a hazard too, so be sure to always visually inspect for your inquisitive kitty before turning on appliances with doors. The kitchen is literally a kitten minefield, from poisonous products and cabinets to hot surfaces when your kitty's big enough to jump on the stove. But there's good news. The same products designed to keep kids safe will help keep your kitty safe too, like childproof latches. And good news, they're inexpensive. For as little as $4, and you can find them in the baby section of most home improvement stores. Well, that's it for today. And if you're looking for any more information on pets, you can find it at AnimalAttractionsTV.com. From everyone here at Animal Attractions TV, thanks for watching.